Okay. So. Here we are again. We are. Here we are again. We're now hey. streaming on Facebook onto the Silver Tent uh, group. Welcome everyone again. It's lovely to see you all for our second episode of Sex and the Older Woman. And this time we're going to be focusing on self-pleasure. So let's open up the discussion with self-pleasure and um, yeah, just general terms. What is self-pleasure for you? How do you do it? How often? What does it feel like? Who would like to start? And maybe <laughs> whoever starts and whoever goes next, introduce yourself. Because yes, good point. Because yeah. Who would like to go first? Who's going first? I'll go first. <laughs> go for it, Sunday. You look like you want to go. <laughs> Ta -da! Right, I'm Sunday. I, I'm in England. I live in Ilkley. Um, been a member of the Silver Tent for a while and uh, enjoying these Silver Tent conversations and especially enjoying this Sex and the Older Woman one. So, yes, what was the question? It was about... Our oh, pleasure. Um, yeah, so I've been thinking, I've been out on a bike ride today, which is one of my self-pleasure things. And I started to think about along the lines of self-pleasure and how, how in its broadest sense, I've had to give myself permission to feel all of that, whether it be in my day-to-day -day living, whether it be in the bed, in having sex, or whether it's the other things around that, the food, the alcohol, the shopping, the buying things. It, it, it opened up into a really big thought process as I was thought process as, as I was cycling along and um, and I got to thinking about work and how work isn't seen as something that is pleasurable and my experience of being happy at work was met with um, confusion I think for some people you know there's that saying isn't the people miss the opportunity of work because it it is dressed in overalls or something. There's some sort of saying around it. And actually I used to get a lot of pleasure out of working, primarily because I think I just like being with people. So that, at that base level, you know, that for me is self-pleasure is like hanging out with people, having fun, being playful, being engaged, and then, the other aspects of self-pleasuring are the things that I actually choose to do for my body, my mind, my soul, my spirit, things that I know nurture and nourish me, make me feel expanded, make me feel present. So I know that's all sort of a bit theoretical, but it, it felt important for me to sort of be bring that broad brush into this because it is more than just about, because as somebody starts to say self-pleasure, I think a lot of people's focus goes straight on to orgasms and sex and and I was thinking okay so sexual sexual pleasure and sensual pleasure where's that sort of is sensual pleasure something that prepares me for sexual pleasure you know like how do I um put myself into the position to be ready for an orgasm if that's the ultimate goal in sense in, in my self-pleasuring which it isn't and I was also thinking about the role of food, the role of alcohol, like buying things, how my self-pleasure, how I feast my eyes on pictures, because before on Works of Art, I would probably a little be a little bit blind to the pleasure that I get now from looking at beautiful pieces of artwork and noticing more about people's creativity in that realm. And of course, music, you know, when I get the goosebumps on my body, you know, that's like the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. You know, that for me is is pleasure. And taking responsibility, obviously, for the self-pleasure that I feel. Um, and, that, and I did start to then think more and dig a bit deeper into sensual um, self-pleasuring and sexual self-pleasuring, which I know we're going to move on to, but yeah, that's sort of my sort of take in this moment around self-pleasure. 
Beautiful. Thank you, Sunday. I think we'll come, we will come back to some of those topics, but let's uh, have some others join in as well. What about Diane or Gwen? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When we when we had our sort of initial thinking about this and discussions, one of the things that comes to mind for me is candle wax. I love playing with melting candle wax. And I do this. I, there used to be a, a restaurant I used to go to up in Aberdeen um, and with a group of people. And um, it was hilarious because I would sit and play and I wasn't even conscious half the time what I was doing. And other people would be kind of looking at me and, you know, but but kind of dropping it and, and playing around with it, you know, sort of fiddling with it in my hands mm. and moving it around and that real sensuality to it. You know, it's it's, it's really beautiful um yeah and it kind of you know it's cool and it it's not like you say <clears throat> Sunday it's not like it's necessarily leading anywhere else like an orgasm because that's like just one thing but but actually that pleasure but another thing that gives me enormous pleasure um is sound I'm, I was going to say music but actually yes music but music's only one part of sound and that whole you know I have various instruments like a gong and I have drums and I have flutes and um but also my voice I love singing and I get an incredible um sensation throughout my body from you know from singing or from humming humming is incredibly good for you I don't know if any of you do humming um or chanting om and things you know but but you can just get this amazing vibration and sensation and stuff through your body and that's remarkably healing um so yeah yeah those are just the thoughts that are arising to start off with yeah mm, thank you Diane Gwen, do you want to say anything? Yeah, hi, I'm Gwen. Uh, I'm just going to say my voice is going a little bit. Um, I kind of want to, I, I think the reason that could be um, could be going <laughs> was I was away at a festival at the weekend. So I was away for five days and I probably never stopped talking and I probably talked more than I ever do in my life, really. <laughs> but one of the things I did um, amongst, well, just the whole aspect of being in nature all the time, going to sleep in nature, waking up in nature, walking barefoot, being around other women and connecting was so pleasurable. And I felt it in my body. You know, I felt alive. I felt connected. Uh, and one of the things I did when I was um, away was I did a paint workshop. And this was the most liberating, playful, fun, expressive thing I think possibly I've well, done, certainly as an older woman. And I would have done this as a younger woman. But as I've got older, I've kind of become... Uh, a bit more um, contracted in giving myself pleasure, particularly physical pleasure. I've shut down a little bit, certainly since my divorce six years ago. And so what this workshop was about was uh, sitting in a circle as women talking about how we felt about our bodies. Now, this was women of all ages. And for me, it was very much about being in this older body and, and how I wasn't as accepting of it as I used to be. I wasn't enjoying it as, uh, as much as I used to enjoy my body. And then the next stage of the group was for us to remove our clothes and stand in circle and have the permission to look at each and every woman standing there. And there were about 13 women in the group. And that was so pleasurable to have permission to look at each other, to look at all the different bodies that are there because, you know, we turn away, it's so frowned upon. You know, you go to the swimming bath, somebody gets undressed and you look away and yet that's what exactly what you want to do. You want to look at the different breasts and 
and, and lady gardens and bellies and bums and all of that. And then the next thing was we went into the spares and we all had two containers of paint and we just squirted each other. Mm -hmm. and, this, and we squealed and we laughed. We were covered in paint, <laughs> absolutely covered. And it was so freeing. Then we all ran down the field and through the whole festival, and there were men there. But it was just, I, I just couldn't believe the transformation from wanting to hide my older body to being so freely able to enjoy it and express it. Honestly, I think everybody should have a go at this. But it just, <laughs> I mean, I, I, well, I haven't quite put photographs on Facebook. I've sent them to friends. But the it, it, there was no shame, there was no embarrassment, it was pure joy and pleasure, and that was self-pleasure. I also mm. did uh, another workshop, and I realised <clears throat> we had to connect with our yonis, with our, our wombs, with those sensual, very sensitive places uh sexual places in our bodies and i really did truly realize how much i had closed down uh in the last six years and it was great having this conversation to come to because i thought this is exactly what i need i need to have a self-pleasure practice to bring life back into my entire body to activate the chi that comes from self-pleasure, the life force, bring that joy back, healing and joy back into my body. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> sounds beautiful and incredibly <laughs> powerful. And I love that kind of work when with the paints and stuff like that, I want to explore that more. Yeah. What about it's... you, Melanie? So, yeah, just a reminder of me. So my name's Melanie Knight. I'm, uh, I teach uh, and, and do body work uh, with women in sexuality. So I love all this sort of stuff. I think it's incredible. I think this touches on something that Sunday was saying as well, that somehow we, well, certainly for me, I've had felt a lot of my life, I've had to be sensible and go to work and, you know, work, I, d I do find work quite enjoyable, but there's certainly not the level of pleasure and freedom that I get from this kind of stuff. So for me, um, yeah, I love pleasure. Um, I love the, the um, you know, the walks in nature and stuff like that, I think is incredible when you actually really connect. And I I think Sunday, one of the questions I had for you, which I'll come back to in a moment, was what makes the difference between just a walk in the countryside mm. and one that's incredibly pleasurable. And I think, you know, some of the things we're touching on here is a is very mindful and um, using the word spiritual that might not work for everyone, but just really a, a different way of looking and connecting to pleasure. Um, and being very mindful about it, not just, you know, not just walking in the park just because, you know, we're walking the dog and we're on our phones and stuff like that. But actually, you know, just making every moment of pleasure count, like really noticing, you know, for me, it's about noticing the leaves and the breeze and the beautiful flowers and the you know, the, the insects and the ladybirds and whatever else is, is there and really taking it in, using my senses and my touch and, and just really exploring that um, is what makes it pleasurable for me. Otherwise, I'm just like off on my phone or something. Mm. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to turn the attention a bit to, to more sexual and sensual pleasure more on a uh, sexual level um for me my practice has changed since doing a lot of this work um 
I think I might have shared last time I was very into BDSM and pain and stuff like that. And I've moved away from that a lot. My, my tastes have changed over doing a lot of tantric work in slowing down and noticing touch and the feeling of, of you know, being more sensual and, and slower and taking, taking every moment again with what is it feeling like in my body? What am I noticing? Where is the, am I, you know, am I feeling the pleasure? Am I feeling, is it arousing? Even if I've, it's not going to an orgasm, it's just actually really noticing um, where that pleasure is. And again, I think we can be quite switched off, especially when we're going straight to an orgasm. It's like, okay, I've got to get to the orgasm. This is actually, there's pleasure in the journey, not in the outcome. And well, not, not, not in the outcome, but there's pleasure in the journey. And, you know, if we choose to have an orgasm, that that's completely pleasurable too. But it's, it's for me, it's about the journey now. Um, I spend a lot of time on massage, massaging my own body with oils. I find oils very sensual. Um, and that, again, is something I never used to play with before. Um, and sometimes toys, but my reliance on toys is, you know, has, has dissipated a bit. And um, But I'd love to hear more from what everyone else thinks about those sorts of more sexual and sensual self-pleasure. Who would like to go next? <laughs> the all gone quiet, is there for me. <laughs> just thinking about this stuff, is about you know? pleasure. <laughs> letting it percolate. Yeah. Yeah. Letting it I did say a lot there. So yeah. <laughs> letting it percolate. I awesome. think the thing that comes to mind for me is um you know, one of the things about aging is that I know my body better. I know oh, what it likes, I know what makes it feel good. And, um, and I, again, I feel very blessed that my childhood and my young adulthood, I've not had a lot of adverse um, events in my life that have closed me down because I know that that is obviously often the case. I did, yeah, maybe this is another topic. I mean, I did have, um, I was sexually violated at the age of eight, nine, and that did stop me, put me off kissing because that was the violation, but I, I won't go into that, but that maybe is a topic that we talk about how those adverse events affected sexuality and our sexual connection with ourselves. Anyway, I digress. So for me, like I know that the thing that I love is having my inner forearm stretched, you know, this from here to here. And, but, and I don't know how I discovered that. <laughs> and one day I did and I thought and this is a sensual part of me and how I connect with my body in ways that like like you putting oil on and and like and, and and I've just recently doing these calls are great because it realizes where I've dropped my practice dropped my connection mm -hmm. to this part of my being and and how I am in the world and um but I am aware that I touch myself a lot on a regular basis. You know, unconsciously, I will stroke myself. You know, I will there'll be a part of me that I'll get fascinated in, like, backs of my hands or something. And, and But in terms of sexual, um, sexual um, pleasure, it's waxed and it's waned over the years. And now I'm older. It definitely tends to be a last thing at night, hit the vibrator, get there, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, Thank you so much. <laughs> and there's nothing old, wrong with that. I do. I've that got too. an old pink nice. rabbit that's probably uh -huh. on its last legs, a little bit noisy, unless I press it in a certain place. And the ears are wonderful. <laughs> you know, I never knew what that was until today. I never knew what the rabbit was. And oh. it, 
It's a type of, for those who are on the women out there, it's a type of vibrator, and I'm sure Sandy can describe it, but that is twice <laughs> now. Never haven't had to work in my life before. <laughs> I was sharing with Gwen about this different type of vibrator. Do you remember, Gwen? How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually I've actually ordered one. It hasn't come through yet, but it's this um sucking. Have you heard of it, Sunday? Yes. I've got moment. one. <laughs> You've got one. How is it? Because I I've been yeah. trying to drive. I prefer my rabbit. <laughs> your rabbit. I've heard so many good things about this. I've got to try it. <laughs> it's shaped like a little Just rose for The viewers to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a vibrator you put over your clitoris and it sucks it like yeah. a hoover. Yes. It's not quite like a hoover. Not quite, well, it's like pulses and stuff. So. <laughs> oh, don't try the hoover at home. <laughs> Well, actually, that might be a good uh, subject for what things have we tried, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the jet wash is really good. I had a go with a jet wash one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. water pressure is really... Yeah, I sometimes I do that. those. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear me. Anyway. I have one of those spa baths, you know, that had the water jets. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but one thing I think is important... To just mention, particularly as we as older women, it's really useful to have a good lubricant. And, uh, and, and I definitely, uh, there's quite a lot of very good natural ones out there. And in fact, I would use coconut oil. Yeah, I was going to add that, actually. I tend to use oils. So um, fractionated coconut oil or almond oil are really good. Um and castor oil can be very good as a healing if you're doing massage from a healing point of view as well. Um, but yeah, I tend to use massage uh, natural oils now. Yeah, because... it's quite important just to that just to say that if we are using toys and vibrators, it's particularly us as older women, it's advisable to use something yeah and I think uh, while we talk we're on the subject of that I think it's also worth saying about vibrators as well um, and it might not be everyone's experience but one thing I loved uh, in the write-up of the um the sucking one that I've just bought is that it's it's uh, known for not numbing sensation um an overuse of vibrators I think I don't have any evidence for this, but I suspect, especially as an older woman, because the lining of the um, of that area thins a lot. So I suspect it could be quite easy to feel sore or pain in that area. Um, and it might be the, the the use of the vibrator, not not just you know, needing needing lubricant. So for anyone out here who does experience that, it might be worth experimenting. Um. Yeah. Anyway, well, where, where, where did, did we, we get, get to? to? I don't know. I'm lost now. <laughs> the the thing you were asking, yeah, you were asking what what we did. You know, sort of specifically, more se centrally, yes. sexually. Yeah. Diane, do you want to add? Yeah. Um. So actually, it's funny, Sunday. You saying about the inside bit of the art. Yeah, I discovered that one years ago, and it's it is. I I quite like stroking myself there. That's I do yeah. find that very pleasurable, really, and quite a nice calming thing as well. Um. So yeah, somewhat something that I can't do for myself, but an area that I know is a real erogenous zone for me is the back of my neck. Mm. Um. Oh yeah. Like, just down there and it's just like yeah any guy who touches me there I tell you you know I have to be really careful so <laughs> luckily a lot of guys don't seem to be aware of it which is great well um, they might never... be now <laughs> <laughs> this is going on YouTube so. <laughs> that's true well it's all right they could but, learn something give yeah, more women definitely. Pleasure. Why not? I love Why not? that area too and I think it's nice to talk about erogenous zones because there are a lot more we tend to focus on our genitals but there are a lot of yeah yeah but, erogenous yeah. I, zones I, I, I that we don't that, think about yeah I mean to me the back of the neck is much more 
a turn on than than other areas that are more obvious um so yeah i was trying to think other other things as well so uh, yeah but you mentioned lubricants and so i'll just put in here um i use um olive oil um, mm-hmm. But not cooking olive oil. I'm not suggesting <laughs> one got in the kitchen. You can buy <laughs> stuff from the chemist, which is just, you know, olive, small bottles of olive oil that have been um, pharmaceutically treated. So, yeah, so I would, I, I, I use that. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting that one actually, because I found when I was younger, I, you know, you can get dry at any time, but you can also be very juicy at any time as well. Um, and it just might take a little while to kind of get things flowing. But I don't know what your experience is. But for me, once it's flowing, it's flowing. Um, you know, it's not a problem. Um, so I'm very lucky there, I guess. But um, yeah, interesting. And for, in terms of personal practice, because that's the word you said, wasn't it, Melanie? Kind of, do you have a person? Mm. I just do everything in the moment, but that's the way I lead my life. You know, it tends to be very much in the moment. But I do know that springtime, I definitely get the sap rising in yeah. March. I definitely, you know, feel that energy. And um, yeah, you know, I tend to be more active. <laughs> <laughs> in March <laughs> then I can possibly other times of the year might be might be quieter so yeah but uh, yeah there I've you not, go I've not yeah. tracked the months that's an interesting way to do it actually I know well I just it was just something I noticed and I would definitely be kind of seeking out things that this was all this was all after I split up with my son's father and I I kind of part of my journey with that was actually rediscovering myself and it's interesting Gwen you say you've closed you feel you've closed down since your divorce actually I just found it incredibly liberating because I realized I'd closed down during my my marriage which is sad you know sad for us both really Mm. um you know so that was really interesting just rediscovering that part of me and yeah, I had a lot of fun <laughs> should mm-hmm. say, after that. But anyway, yes. Beautiful. Um, you just made me, we would, it might be slightly off the topic, but I think it's worth bringing up. Um, you talking about juiciness and stuff. My experience from talking to women um, <clears throat> of our age that actually the opposite can be true is like the very you know and I know we've touched on using lubricants and stuff like that but vaginal dryness yes. obviously as we go into menopause can be quite a challenge for a lot of people yeah. and soreness so I was sharing the other day that I had what I thought was persistent UTIs for you know a year or two um, not realizing till I happened to go to the gynecologist for something else, but that she told me that it wasn't UTI after all. It was, it was a vagina wall thinning, and gave me some estrogen cream. Um, I've now swapped on to a, a natural version of uh, estrogen and um, estrogen and pestogen. Is that the words? Um, cream and I think you know that's made a huge difference it feels like my uni's gone back to what it used to be in terms of you know juiciness and stuff like that so I think also it's worth bringing up because a lot of people I was talking to someone just last week actually on a course I was on um, how she feels that area is so dead that she doesn't feel that she'd ever be able to you know potentially Mm. have penetrative sex again and I think you know I just think it's worth reassuring women that there are things out there that that can be done in this area and it's not over you know I think um these are such important conversations they are and they are aren't they and and not just for us as older women but for younger women too Mm -hmm. there is just appalling uh sex education around you know, it's very, very uh, biological, functional, and we need to talk about pleasure and 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 how the body changes and 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 what happens if we're going through a very stressful situation. So there's a lot of just lack of information and knowledge and conversation. Yeah. 
And, and that's why these are really so, so, so important. So, because I think, you know, it's quite, a, it's sort of like expected ma men will masturbate from an early age. You know, boys will wank day and night, but, mm. but not girls, you know. That's a fallacy to use a poem. No, I know, I know. <laughs> that was the societal message out there. Good girls don't do that. You know, it's shameful. Boys can do it as much as they want, but there's an awful lot of kind of conditioning and programming around girls. And, the, and, and you're absolutely right. That is not the truth of it. Mm. But what happens is... It makes it what it does is it instills Shame. fear, Shame. And, fear. Mm -hmm. and uh and and therefore you know we, we still have that now as older women you know how how can we dispel some of these myths how can we help each other how can we help our younger women as well mm. and I think well, a question to put sorry suddenly i'll come back to you in a sec is it is, is it the question well i want to put it to the audience actually i think oh, it's okay. a really nice thing to you know for anyone watching this whether now or later to you know to bring your questions you know this is the only way we can we can dispel these myths is is actually with people you know sharing what their myths are and and you know and or even what feels true for people, because very often what we feel is true is, is very often, you know, see so deeply rooted, but it's not necessarily the truth. So just to put a call out there for everyone to participate and share and put your questions out there. Hello. Sunday? That we were coming on here to talk about self pleasure. Yeah, we. Were. I could feel myself going, "Oh, what, what am I going to say?" Or what's, you know, I was reticent, and I could feel my inhibitions, but also my fear of getting it wrong. You know, mm -hmm. that some aspect of my body that I didn't know and understand. You know, information about, for example. I watched a program today on some of I'm not going to say what channel it's on, but it's called The Principles of Pleasure. And uh, what I'd never known was the clitoris, this tiny little mind on the outside, is this huge uh, piece of the body inside. Mm, I'd never realised this. This I, I'm 66 and I never knew this. I never knew that the G spot is um, it, it, it is stimulated by the inside of the clitoris. Mm. I never knew this. And, there, and if I don't know this, and I trained as a tantric priestess, how much out there do we not know? Yeah. Are we not? Yeah. Right. Part of my work with women is to do something what we call mapping, which is to look at the different parts of the clitoris, this whole, well, not the whole vaginal area or the yoni, some people call it, um, is to really map out the different parts, the inner lips, the outer lips, uh, you know, the different um, areas, because they're all sensitive in their own way. And they all contain pressure if we, mm. you know, stroke them and, and stimulate them in various different areas. But yes, you're right. We don't, we're not taught this. I didn't know it until I went to tantric workshops. And it's such a shame when we don't have that mind-body connection. So mapping is about touching and exploring an area and creating that mapping in our mind to actually what is this sensation I'm feeling in my body and where is that on my body so that's a really beautiful mindful practice and then that starts to encourage women to be able to experience more pleasure because we're so focused very often on just the clitoral the clit. yeah. mm. Sunday, you were about to say something earlier. Well, I thought you were going to ask the question, which was... Which, which question? The first orgasm thing. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't forgotten, but I wasn't sure which question you were talking about. Well, let's go to that one. What do you want to say about that one, Sunday? Anyway, yeah, and it, for me, poof, I had no... 
I didn't know an awful lot. Strange as that may be, living on a farm, you'd think that I perhaps would know quite a bit, but it was I was sort of really naive, which I suspect we all are. And so when I had the first, in, well, when I first had this sensation that came over me, that I then realised was an orgasm, was when I was on a horse. Um. And, and I was riding the horse, and I've been thinking about this today. So that what am I, what, I think what brought it on was this, and there's a bit of shame around this, so bear with me. Um, I felt like I was in control and dominating this animal underneath me because, long story short, I was forced to do quite a lot work-wise, farm-wise, and um, controlled and dominated, and I was the youngest, so I had nobody else to... I got a lot of that dumped down on me, but I was the end of the line. So where did I dump my, the side, you know, passing the pain parcel on. So to have this sort of feeling of trying to get this animal, this pony, Sylvester, as it was, or was it Cavelli? I don't know. Anyway, it was one of those two. And I, and I was squeezing my legs really hard and forcing him to do something perhaps that he didn't want to do. And I did. And then I had these sensations come over me. And I hadn't a clue. I thought I'd wet myself, actually, to be honest. And so I trotted off to my mum, bless her. <laughs> I said, mum, I've had this really strange sensation, like I was weeing myself. And what was it? And she just, she didn't say anything because she'd not talked to me about this sort of thing at all. Obviously, I'd started my periods. I'm rem remembering that this is going on YouTube at this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <well, you> know. <laughs> and so the, the upshot, the funny bit about this was one night I was, I was, uh, I just said to her, shouted as I was going out the door, said, "Mum, I'm just going out. I'm just." And she said, "Where are you going?" I said, "Just going for a ride." But Sunday it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I won't be long." <laughs> you. <laughs> But there were those moments of, you know, when it, you go into what I would call oblivion, where the whole world, world could implode and you wouldn't be aware. Well, those moments, I was totally out of control of this cantering horse that was underneath me. <laughs> and I, I'm pleased to say that I became less dominating than, than I had been that time when it first initiated. But interesting that it scared me when I think about that, you know, it sort of scared me that that, that dominating, controlling aspect of myself, which mm. is in me. And it hasn't materialised into anything that I would consider kinky sex. You know, I haven't had that experience of BDSM and all that and not, you know, and mm. just haven't had that, you know, and um, it's part of me that is slightly scared of that side of, the, of, sexual, of, of sexual pleasure, from pleasure from pain wouldn't be my um, choice and I know it is for some yeah so thank you for listening to that little story and I'm grateful to my mum who um, she didn't say an awful lot and yet she just I guess she knew and didn't make it wrong really you know yeah yes, that's lovely and thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that mm, thank you that's really lovely got a lot of exercise did it <laughs> <laughs> I spread it around I had a few <laughs> they could almost all <laughs> got it <almost> again <laughs> oh brilliant any other first orgasms that want to she shared or well, it's not my first because I have no idea when my first one was. I honestly don't know. But I do remember, uh, I mean, I, I definitely was self, self-pleasuring self in, in um, kind of fairly obvious ways by the time I was into my t early teens. But when I was 17, I remember being on a bus and my legs were crossed and I was on the top of the bus, which is always a bit more wobbly than, you know, the the, the lower deck on a bus. And it was hilarious because I suddenly thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going in. I knew what I was going into. And I thought, this is in public. I'm what am I doing? What's going on? 
and it was hysterical and I the trouble is I've no idea whether I was making any noise I was very conscious by then the fact that you can make a lot of noise at times and I thought I hope I'm not making any noise here (laughs) stuff going on in my head while there are other things happening in other parts of my body it was just so funny Mm -hmm. it was so funny um yeah 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 a funny memory but yeah Oh, this would just make this would just make the best ever sort of performance, wouldn't it? Ensemble <laughs> performance about your first orgasm. <laughs> I, God knows, I have no idea how why I did this, but I discovered a, I discovered orgasm at quite an early age. <laughs> I used to use a pencil, a pencil. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I never, and then I later on with uh, my first ever boyfriend uh, had orgasms, but it was never penetrative orgasms. So why I ever used this pencil, I do not know to insert into my vagina, but I hid them, you know, there would have been no noise because unlike you, Sunday, if my mother had known she, her response would have been very different. It would have been disgusting, you know, and keep your hands above the duvet sort of thing. So I'm interested looking back now, thinking I I lived in a household where that was never talked about, sex was never talked about, the word masturbation, I don't think had ever been used in front of me. I knew how to do it. But I knew I had to hide it as well. And that's and that's experience. I know that's experience of a lot of, and still is, you know, which is why I suppose I go back to this thing about talking about it and talking about the different sorts of orgasm. Because what we see on TV is um, uh, the man and woman come together and they simultaneously orgasm. Pen, he, he penetrates her and they both have this wild mm. orgasm. How many people have had that experience? But that creates a lot of pressure when I talk, and men especially as well, it creates a lot of pressure to perform in that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, and I say, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it to the men as well, because they don't get, um, you know, I, I not all men, but a lot of men, don't really know what to do with the woman. The woman can't bring Mm -hmm. herself to tell the man what gives her pleasure. And so he's guessing. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know. Nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. (laughs) (laughs) And then when we wonder why I think we're not happy necessarily in in relationships, a lot of people aren't. And I think it's such a shame because... You know, we've lost the knowledge of thousands of years ago where men would be taught how to pleasure yes. a woman. Yes. Um, you know, the, like the elder women would teach younger men how to pleasure a woman. Yeah, well, well there's a role. Yeah, <laughs> there's a role there is a role. <laughs> I'm sure it's sure it. fulfilling that one. Actually. Well, I do to a degree in my, my position here. Uh, but it is, it's, it's you know, it's, it's an, a wise woman elder role um, that I think has been lost. And, and so people learn off porn or, you know, or friends or magazines. And it's, it's just so, it's all myths. And it's I can't like, understand in a way, I can't understand why. It's such a secret taboo thing, you know, and the body and all its functions are all hidden away and and we miss out. I just think we miss out on the educational part of it and the loveliness of it all, really. That's and a it, whole subject in its it own is, right. And it, makes, it's, it, it just mm. makes it all dive underneath and become smutty and sordid and, and invisible and a mystery and... It, it, it doesn't serve us somehow for it all to go well, it, it, it but it was hidden house, the patriarchy yeah mm. it was hidden for thousands of years because people didn't men didn't want women to be powerful and in that role we are powerful sexual beings and we are um and that was hidden throughout society mm. throughout history 
and so that's a whole subject in its own mm. right which I'm sure you know it's Gwen and myself could probably talk more about at some point <laughs> um but yeah it's it's such a shame because then we, we've gone down a, a road which I think leaves both men and women very dissatisfied with their sexual experiences. Is that true of all societies though? Because I'm just thinking when I was in Zimbabwe, um, person that I knew there, she was she was still a virgin. She was in her late twenties, but she wasn't married. But she said, you know, she'd had, you know, teachings basically on how to pleasure and get pleasure in in sex. Mm. but it wasn't you know she was just waiting she was waiting for the time and she'd be able to use it essentially yeah I think it's difficult to talk for other cultures and stuff like yeah. that but my understanding is a lot of a lot of other cultures also don't have that sort of experience but you know it's difficult it would be lovely to hear from people from other cultures uh, what their yeah. thoughts are on this and maybe that is um how we can uh, expand this conversation to some degree, Diane. It's looking at different cultures and their attitudes and their beliefs and and, and what does happen uh, around conversations and practices that um, are not, you know, some of what I've said today is uh, there are generalizations, but it would be good to know uh, about the differences. Mm. And, and even in our community, as, as Ellen said earlier, you know, if you listen to this or the recording, it would be great to hear what what your experience is and uh, and and just to add to the conversation, please. That would be most welcome. Mm, it would. Um, so I'm conscious we've only got about 13 minutes left. A couple of other points we had on our. Um, thoughts to talk about was um, how does pain and disability impact self-pleasure? Does anyone want to have experience of that, want to share about that? I certainly can. But I just, when I damaged my back and had nerve damage, um, and it could be that it was that and also I was in um, grief and on citalopram antidepressants at the time because I know certain medications can actually stop you getting erect I'm not a woman I don't get erections but you know what I mean it stops you getting stops um, you. aroused yeah it can have a numbing effect on, on the, the libido um, so yeah. when that the when that had the combination of those two things lower back injury on medication I couldn't get there I'd like get to this point and it never broke do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It breaks, doesn't it? The orgasm sort of like goes to here and then it goes whoosh. Well, mine does. I don't know. Big conversation around types of orgasms. But it it um it never broke and it it was horrendous. Yeah. It really was. It was like trying to sing, but you lost your voice. It was that sort of thing. Or whistle and you like you can't your whistle wouldn't come. It was that sort of sensation. So that's my experience of and it. It stopped, I stopped doing that for quite some time and, and then it came back and I was relieved. There was such a relief that, oh, okay, because I thought if that's gone, you know, there was a fear attached to it that I possibly could, will never have another orgasm. And then it, it came back, which was a huge relief. That's, yeah, that's my bit of um, injury, I suppose, and um, its impact. That's really significant, Sunday. Mm, I was thinking, I hadn't even thought of that. How many people might be on medication mm. and they can't um, have any sort of uh, sexual stimulation or orgasm? I mean, and and what what grief there would be in that? What a great sense of loss, especially if you're in relationship. I mean, that's another thing we don't talk a lot about either. Mm. Mm. And I think that's really, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, that really that is something. And I'm sure there will be members of our community mm. that are experiencing oh, that. Definitely. And I think, you know, 
one of the things that strikes me is that we certainly, as who are UK based, we live in a society which is, you know, GPs hand out pills for mm-hmm. you know, anything, pain medication, depression, all that sort of stuff, and and not really concerned about side effects and worried about oh well you know you'll lose you might lose your libido well what what you know what's the matter with that really you know there is this there is this just you know just put pills to solve the problem which Mm. um i think very often doesn't and people but people don't know that there are potentially other ways to to do things um I've lo- I've lived, I think I shared on the last video, but I've lived with chronic pain for about seven years. Um, and I was determined not to let it affect my sex life and, and my libido, but it, I also didn't want to take huge amounts of pain medications. Um, but it's tough living with pain every day. It's yeah. draining. Um, you know, just moving off the sofa can be hard work. You, you start counting the steps you make between the kitchen and the lounge or whatever, because it's just it, everything's hard work. So the thought of making love on top of that can be just like, you know, just like, oh, I can't be bothered. Um, but I didn't want to live like that. But pushing past it every day can also be a challenge and actually what I found through tantric practices was not pushing past it but learning to relax into it and learning to notice my body and what my body needed but that that also takes time and it takes a lot of I suppose daily practice you know self-project practice or whatever that you know to really sit and be with what's in our body and not try and fix it with with you know, pain medication. Um, so it can be, but it can be really debilitating. I don't think we talk, I think we talk quite a bit about disability, but actually chronic pain is a, is a problem. I, I can't remember the stats now, but it's a huge problem across the world. And yet the endorphins from having self-pleasure yeah can, can alleviate can, the pain and actually relaxing into it can relieve pain because again we tense up so much mm-hmm. with stress and also orgasm the kind of orgasm that most of us know about is a is a tensing up version yeah yeah um which actually can you know can make pain worse mm-hmm. but relaxing into pleasure actually can really be beneficial for pain it's difficult though, isn't it? Because it can be hugely difficult. Yeah, it's difficult sometimes to relax into pain. I mean, I've been there as well and, mm. and I've tried breathing through it, but I've also taken painkillers as well. Yeah, and I do too. It's not that I completely come off painkillers. Mm. Uh, um, and I know some people who do it completely pain free. Mm-hmm. Um, like I was watching a, a slightly off subject, but a while ago I was watching a um, you know a whole giving birth thing and the whole you know being able to have orgasms during giving birth when you really relax into the pain, it's possible to have orgasms. Wow. I often wondered at that twenty seven and a half hours in labour and I never yeah. had an orgasm. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's such a thing to say. You came out on an orgasm. To you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen the evidence. I've seen videos, and I've heard of people doing it. And it's you know, it can be done. It's mindful practice and relaxing into pain. It's not. Yeah. It is a you know, our bodies know what it needs to do to enjoy pleasure. It's and just... I wonder how much it is the brain that actually you know, like. If you really twigged into self pleasuring, it must feed on itself because obviously our beliefs, our values, our be- our behaviors are based on what we tell ourselves. So if if we go around saying, um, well, what whatever we say, you know, mm. I can have multiple orgasms, for instance. I mean, I've never said that to myself because I don't have that as an experience and I don't believe it. But then if I kept training myself. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see, if I trained myself, you know, maybe I too could have it on the bus every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is that same thing with the pregnancy that I was just talking about, giving birth. Mm. You have it that giving birth is hard and painful. But actually, it doesn't need to be like that. It's our mind no. that tells us yes. that because we've been Who told us that. that. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but my body obviously seems to know what it needs to do because in the past couple of years I've had started having orgasms in my sleep quite regularly oh wow that is amazing yeah, yeah. so that's my self-pleasure uh practice I just go to bed and go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> oh, mom, no hands <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that actually brings me to a point, uh, Gwen, that uh, Sunday pointed to there as well, this about being possible. There's something I've been playing with recently, which is there's a slight block for me, which is my body feels it's able to have an orgasm without me touching it. Yes. Breath. And for me, that's a slight block because I can feel it's possible, but there's something in me that says this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> like, like it's not possible, but it completely is. It completely is. I've, I've, I've come very close to orgasm just through breath work, tantric mm-hmm. breath work. Yeah. yeah. Me too. And touch as well. Well, not touch, but no touch, uh, just breath. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking not even touch. I was thinking, yeah, breath work and just, I can't even think the, I haven't got a good example, but just, yeah, the, just the state I'm in. Can you it's, imagine? It's orgasmic state. Can you imagine if we are just walking orgasms and the energy that's going into the planet and everybody as a result of that? I like to see that, you know, they say about your vibration, Mm. You know, and if we're vibrating at that level, it must like how healing is that for the planet, people? I think, you know, I, th- I, d- I just like that thought that my I love that is thought too. Linking out that. and healing on that level, yeah. Well, I think there's two things there for me. I think there's that. Um, I've been playing with the possibility that it is totally possible to be orgasmic twenty four seven. As a lot, as a lot, I just style. like to hear from Diane before we go. What yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, we haven't heard from you for a while, Diane. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting, sort of. Wait, but where my mind's gone is there is also a condition that means that some women constantly have orgasms and they don't want it. You know, that's and nice. that's you know and I can't remember what it's called now and I really feel for someone who's going through that because that must be horrendous you know feeling so yeah that must be disempowering in in unbelievable ways you know which is and I just you know I mean I think part of my problem is so many people just you know it's, it's that classic thing of ignoring a lot of stuff to do with women's women's stuff and that's why, you know, mm. people don't, you know, Gwen, you know, you didn't know about the clitoris, you know, because people didn't do research on on it because, well, it's just there. You know, we know what it is, you know, so not realizing it's, you know, goes seven or eight inches up into the body. You know, um, it's like, wow, you know, that's mm. as long as a man's penis or yep. longer than a lot of men's penis, you know, and and it's, you know, it's like, wow, you know. That's a big yeah. deal. Yeah. There's two things to add to that. First of all, the women's clitoris isn't in a lot of medical journals, medical mm. books. That's right. Biology. And second of all, I think what you said is use, interesting because the research I've heard recently is in the womb, biologically, men and women have the same parts. That's correct. And the penis is just, it becomes the external part, but the women is, the women is exactly the same. Right. It's just yeah. internal. So we have the same, there's a word for it, but we have the equivalents in each of the each of the female and male versions. And it's, and it's up until five weeks, something like that, mm. before it is determined which yeah. sex by however the the child develops beautiful mm. well i'm conscious it's just got to five o'clock oh, <laughs> time's gone so quickly 
And I think we should wrap it up there because we have scheduled this for an hour. It's been lovely spending time with you all and uh, hearing your stories. And, and this is, you know, this is the way it should be. So thank you very much for sharing. And um, for people watching this, again, feel free to comment on anything. And um, we're all four of us. Well, I'll, I'll speak for me and Gwen, but, you know, Diana's Sunday as well. I'm sure we'll, we'll be looking at the comments and responding yeah. as yeah. we can as well. Uh, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been so much fun. <laughs> it has. It has. It's such amazing subjects that yeah. we need to be sharing with the world. So thank you. And will we be back again for a, a round three of something? Well, I'm thinking yes, but let's uh, let's all talk and plan. But yes, for the audience, I think there'll be more. But uh, yeah, look out for details of that. Yeah, so I'm going to stop the recordings okay. now. Let's pause for a moment.